Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm Paolo, and I work for, for Fortinet. Um, and in particular, there is, a, there is an internal division called FortiGuard, which focuses on, as you can imagine, threat intelligence uh, platforms and services. Uh, but I'm not here to sell any Fortinet products today. I'm not going to uh, <laughs> kind of encourage you to buy any of our products. It's just like research that I've been doing since joining Fortinet. Um, last month, actually, so it's quite new. Uh, and uh, so so summary of the talk is about, you know, what is a threat intelligence platform and services? Uh, what is the Cyber Threat Alliance? Um, how do people actually share data in the alliance? Um, how do we manage right now privacy and, privacy and anonymity in the, in the alliance? Uh, what kind of attacks uh, people have performed in the past um, against anonymity? Uh, and then the, one of the potential solutions is to adopt differential privacy. Uh, and I will put one example, uh, just a very ed um, educational example, I'll use differential privacy. Uh, there will be an example with uh, federated machine learning and another one with homomorphic uh, uh, machine learning, right? And then uh, we'll do a brief overview of what kind of, uh, which companies are working on uh, differential privacy and some roadmap for, for, for our current um, platform. And then some questions uh, at the end. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, big disclaimer, I, uh, I'm not uh, a crypto uh, expert, so I know there are a few uh, crypto uh, people in this room, so uh, please, uh, I apologize in advance if some of the formulas are oversimplified. Um, I've been working in cybersecurity in the last seven years. Uh, I worked for Microsoft before and other uh, small companies in the UK. Uh, I, my previous research was in uh, AI and robotics, so I was working on um, prosthetics, um, artificial gate, uh, uh, this was at the MIT in Boston, so it was developing. I don't know if you see this nowadays. It's those things are they were damn heavy. Uh, can you imagine if, that was like battle and aluminium? It was each process. It was like I don't. Know, it was like 20 kilo or something. So I mean, nowadays they will just leak, uh, uh, you know, new materials. It's quite lightweight, but that that was at the time. It was, must have been 15 years ago, something like that. If you see this today, just have a big laugh. Um, there will be very few animation in, in, in the slides. Uh, I just don't like them. And uh, yeah, there were no mathematicians were armed during this presentation, so I can promise you that. Yeah. Um, I also wor uh, worked on uh, swarm uh, intelligence, uh, and uh, this kind of somehow, that's why I kind of went into cybersecurity. There is a lot of applications of swarm intelligence uh, in cybersecurity, uh, but. That's not for today. Um, so, can I have a, you know, I'll ask a, a few slides to raise your hands, uh, just to get some few statistics for myself. How many people know about, uh, have actually used a threat intelligence platform in this room? Okay, one, two, three, four, that's not too bad. Uh, that's good. And yeah, so, you know, for people that doesn't know about that, it's, uh, you know, I'd rather describe it by the actual functionality rather than uh, using uh, an official definition, but the, the purpose of a threat intelligence platform is to aggregate intelligence from multiple sources. And, uh, you know, there's a, you know, you can pay, there's free ones, paid ones, uh, there are different formats and kind of stuff. Uh, but the idea is to basically curate, normalize, and ingest all these external feeds. Uh, and then, integrate those data with the existing uh, security systems or products you have. Uh, so, you know, you might have your firewall, IPS, endpoint products, uh, various API and US, uh, CIM solution. Uh, and obviously there are a lot of vendors doing that. We are not the only one. Uh, so, so Fortinet, we launched uh, the TIS. There was, a, there was a T before that, but they removed it because it didn't. That wasn't very politically correct. Uh, so Fortinet TIS was launched last year in 2017 in June. Uh, so you can register. Um, it's, you won't, to be honest, you won't find much interesting stuff because it's quite new, but we're working on that. But you know, there are, there's other vendors which have been in this market for, for a longer time, so there's, there's, there's more data in there. Uh, I, 
this is just like a short list of, you know, if I missed everybody in this room, please don't feel offended. Uh, there wasn't enough space. But, you know, there's Anomaly, Palo Alto, RSA, Looking Glass, Cyber Solutions, LogRit, FireEye, Alien Vault. Uh, they're not in any particular order, so it's not any one better than the other ones. Um, and so, obviously, if you have a platform, it's kind of pointless if you don't have data inside your platform. Uh, so that's why you need to, you know, it depends on your size of your company. So if you're a big company, like when I was working for Microsoft, I had telemetry for every possible customer from, from desktop to server. So I was ingesting huge amount of uh, uh, telemetry from, from you know, both uh, internal corporate networks, but also like ex external uh, customers. Uh, but you know, if you're a small company, you don't have much visibility. You have, you know, there's no way you, you have to buy fret Intel from somebody. And you know, I put a few of them. So you have virus total, FireEye, and a to focus the providers, um, and then you know you put all these massive data set. You combine them in your platform, and then if you have a SOC, you you know your SOC uh, security team will basically log into this platform and do threat hunting. You know, discover new trends, uh, find new stuff, and so on. And they can write reports on that one. They can publish them for the industry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, obviously, some of them are free. Some of them, obviously, free stuff is not as good as uh, uh, the one you pay, but there's also paid services which are not that good, so uh, I don't want to make any names. Uh, but, but the big question is how do you trust, you know, how do you actually monitor the quality of the feeds you get every time you buy from a new customer, uh, from, from a new feed, right? So it's kind of a big problem in, in this kind of uh, market. Uh, but hopefully there are sol some solutions that I'm going to talk about. Uh, uh, you can achieve that with, the, um, with differential privacy. Um, so then you have. So these are like technologies, but you need to find a way for companies that are possibly in a competitive market uh, to share data, uh, but in a cooperative environment. And um, so th there are a few alliance, uh, alliances, cyber threat alliances. So this is something that Fortinet uh, basically um, uh, built, I don't know how many years ago, and there are currently 16, 16 partners, and I kind of managed to <laughs> copy and paste all the logos there uh, in no particular order, so, uh, I, but it, all of them. Uh, they are you know, companies, and some of them are national telecom companies. Uh, and you know, the, the entire point of having an alliance is that there is a <laughs> relationship of trust, uh, uh, trust between them. And uh, obviously, uh, there are policies in place that to avoid collusions or uh, competition. Otherwise, I might feed you uh, bad intel, and then you're going to publish an article, you look like a fool, and then maybe, you know, I will revenge uh, in the next time, we'll, you know, we'll do the same thing. So th th there are policies and boards uh, that you know, talks about um, things like, but the, the interest, the, the, but always, obviously, that's not always true because things happen, right? Um, uh, so this is a recent example. This was a, an incident that happened in um, uh, 23rd of May, 2018. Uh, so, uh, so Cisco Talos. Anybody from C Cisco Talos? There was a guy. No, it's not, it's not here today. Uh, they, um, they had much more visibility than, than us uh, at I ISP level. Uh, and they, you know, they did some research on uh, what, uh, what this kind of IoT malware worm called VBM filter. And you know, they wrote an article. And basically, they, they, you know, they are part of the alliance. Everybody in the alliance received a document, uh, which is not ideal, because typically you will do it within a machine with a performance like sticks one or two. Uh, and you, you receive a PDF which said, OK, this is what the malware does. These are all the C2 domains, the IP, uh, the second IPs, uh, first stage, second stage hashes, the actual samples, and everything. Uh, but unfortunately, well, when I was looking at, um, at telemetry, so, so those samples were just given to us, I think it was midnight in UK time, and I was looking at virus total, right? Those samples weren't supposed to be shared any, anywhere, else, but then suddenly you see somebody uploaded uh, the sample on virus total, right? And then you ask, hmm, must have been somebody from the alliance, right? And uh, so things happened, maybe it was by mistake, like the analyst didn't know about the policy, but you know, uh, human error is always there, you know, it is, it is, you, know you can't prevent that. And, uh, I mean, in theory, you can go back and, pan and find out who did it, you know, because virus total is owned by Google, and maybe Cisco talks to Google, and so can you, but yeah, it, 
nobody did anything. It was it wasn't a big deal, but you know things happen, so it's not always as perfect as uh, as it seems. Um, so it seems like a kind of a paradox where people say, "Well, okay, you have a, you know you have a data sharing platform, but like, how, I mean, why do you talk about privacy? Because, well, I mean, it's meant to be open and everybody needs to share, but for you know for very good reasons uh, because obviously uh, you know if there are no privacy uh, or like guarantees in place, people are not going to share their you know samples or or, or audit logs, and I kind of made a sort of a um, so to, uh, um, a ranking of uh, file types and how sensitive they are, and many people in this room maybe will have different opinions uh, because maybe you know, I mean it's 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 very subjective. But so on the left side of the spectrum, you have uh, you know data that usually vendors consider like low privacy. So you know if you have an external IP, you know that that doesn't belong to any customer or you know to any particular vendor. So it's usually be considered to be okay as long as you don't tamper with the IP, which usually happens. <laughs> uh, you get, you know, website domains, uh, binary files, like uh, binary compiled files. Although recently, we have seen cases where the attacker, having, uh, for especially for APT uh, cases, the attacker actually had included username and passwords, passwords of the, uh, from a previous uh, exfiltration stage from the, from the target. So they were like, you know NLTM hashes of the of uh, of the you know of the of the network of the of the customer they were talking in, right? So we're like, wow, well, okay. So 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 uh, you know so people are to be cautious now by sharing even like binary files because inside the the compiled binary sometimes there might be you know sensitive information that and it's very hard to anonymize because you know, there are no tools to do that right now. So uh, but it's, it's so I put it on low, but it might change in the future, right? Uh, sandbox detonation is kind of okay. We, uh, there are cases where there are specific uh, attack groups that they, w they try to fingerprint the particular sandbox that they've been running to. So you, you find interesting string, uh, strings. So we had a, in Microsoft, we had a sandbox solution, and they were you know, really targeting that, uh, that one to, uh, so yeah. So, you know, it's kind of, yeah, it's not low, but in the middle, uh, obviously the software versions and products you use internally, kind of, yeah, you don't really want to re release that because everybody knows if you're vulnerable or not. And then you have emails um, that, you know, contains everything <laughs> inside, like appointments, credit cards, but, but it could be everything inside, who is sending to what. Uh, and then on the right side, which is what people generally don't share too much with the alliance is uh, WEF, uh, you know, Windows event logs. And I've seen so many things, like when I was looking at uh, Windows event logs, there's everything from, well, IP addresses, obviously, you have uh, specific programs. When they open a new tab, you can see the URL from the command line. You can see um, hashes, like uh, password hashes in the command line. Uh, you can see, you know, if you have FTP, username and passwords, uh, people are sloppy, they just put in clear username and password in the uh, common line events. Uh, you know, workstation names, usernames, and all sorts of stuff. Um, Word documents, I didn't mention, but in emails, um, you will think, well, okay, I don't care about the, you know, okay, I, I'm not going to give you the, the, the Word document, but there were examples where the Word document, the title of the, of the document was something like meeting of this CEO with this uh, uh, government official in Israel uh, date. At the year, right? So, uh, so that was enough to basically see what was going on in the company just by the title of the actual document. Uh, pickups, of course. Okay, IP, MAC address, URL, HTTP. Tell everything that you know is not inside SSL. You can, you know, you can you can get all that information. But they are e easier to anonymize. Uh, Linux logs, obviously, audit logs. Um, so okay, so you know, so people say, well, okay, so what, what I can do is I can anonymize all this data, right? So I can uh, just before I send it to the threat intelligence platform, I can do some magic, I can do some shuffling, you know, I can hash some of the fields that I don't need to. Then I send it there. There's a bunch of people <laughs> in the threat intelligence platform. They do that automatically or manually. They write IP signatures. AV signatures, web signature, whatever. They do internal monitoring, then release it to their customers. Uh, they resolve the signatures, hopefully as fast enough, and then maybe you discover more, and then you get this kind of uh, positive feedback loop where you get more binaries, and you re-anonymize them, and you put in the platform, right? So this is kind of, uh, looks like good in principle, but actually it's not um, 
as as good as it looks like. Um, so there is so in, so that's anonymity. This is uh, talking about uh, privacy. Uh, there's, there's two concepts in differential privacy. One is local privacy. Uh, it's quite easy to understand and global privacy. Uh, and it's the same. You, know, you can apply the same concept to uh, to uh, anonymizing logs. But the idea is on, on local privacy as, uh, uh, scenario, you add noise at source, right? So you let's say you anonymize you anonymize your data before you send it to a, to a central aggregator, okay? Uh, and in differential privacy, there is a thing called randomized response that helps you to do, to do that, to achieve good guarant uh, guarantees in privacy. But then you have global privacy, where you put stuff first in a central database, right? And then the analyst or whoever has, has access to that uh, database can only do queries which are uh, uh, privacy protected, right? And there's another mathematical object called Laplace noise that can help you to achieve that. Obviously, just uh, raise your hands. Who thinks the uh, the local privacy approach is uh, better than the the global one? Oh, only one. Okay, only two. And the global one, I guess, is the opposite. Um, there's different philosophy, but the, the main problem here is that if somebody hack you, if you're using a global privacy um, setup, if somebody hacks your you know your main DB, everything is in clear, right? So um, but with this one, right, there's no way you go, go back to the source and find the original data, right? But there are, there are there's pros and cons, but generally the left side is more secure. The left approach, okay. Uh, so people say, well, okay, yeah, why are you talking about differential privacy? Yeah, you know, there's this concept, uh, okay, anonymity. How many people have heard of this? Okay, some people, oh, interesting. Uh, since 1998, 1998, uh, an Italian lady over there, um, and yeah, it was. It didn't really. It didn't become very big. So it was like, yeah, it was people in the academia reading about that. Somebody implement, implemented it in a public API. I don't know if you remember this, but there was it's still there a website that shows you know if a service was hacked, and your email was in there, you can go and check uh, if your email was hacked, and they were using a key anonymity for for doing that anonymously. And, and the main concept is using suppression or generalization to, um, to achieve privacy, but it does not include randomization, and we'll see later why it's important. So it's, uh, and unfortunately, it's not a very good method in high dimensional data um, because it's vulnerable to, join, uh, to uh, joining attacks. Uh, but it's, I mean, it's a weak privacy mechanism, um, and there are variations of that that are stronger than the vanilla algorithm. But it's kind of good to evalu uh, evaluate a privacy vulnerability, right? Uh, so this is an example from our own log. So this is the AV log. It's an internal database where we store uh, information about uh, all the customers that are running our products. So we have antivirus products. Uh, and obviously, this is anonymized in the slides already <laughs> because you know I couldn't really put the you know the, the original information but uh, so this is a table we, 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 we have actually inside Fortinet and it's there's a few more columns but the idea is you have a serial number so this serial number is unique so every time you buy a FortiGate uh, you get a serial number uh, you have the company name uh, these are fictitious. I don't know if we have Mac, uh, McDonald's or Disney. Uh, probably we have, but uh, you know, it's just randomly. Uh, just put it there. Uh, you have the country of the company. You have the industry, the company size, and how many detections that um, that uh, that specific uh, company had, right? And the detections can be, an in this case, was just antivirus. So, like, how many times we blocked something? Okay, and this is in a period of uh, 24 hours. This table, right? Uh, and okay, so if you use the, you can calculate the K anonymity for each column. And of course, uh, serial number has a K anon value of one because it's unique, so <laughs> I can expect that. Uh, customer name is one because if, you know, if I tell you there's only one McDonald for three, you know, you can only register one company in the US called McDonald. Um, obviously, the number of detections is very unique, so you get one. Industry, Obviously, there are more companies in a few industries, so it's 45. But the interesting thing for me was that I didn't really think about this, is that country code, so in our d database, we only have one company that, uh, we, that belongs to a, to a specific uh, country. Uh, so that means it's, that's bad, right? Because if I tell you, well, okay, we, uh, one of our customers from, I'm making it up, from Trinidad, Tobago, 
uh, detections for uh, being infected by Loki or you know, it was under attack, then say, oh, well done. So I know that Fortinet uh, has only one customer called XYZ you know, in, in Trinidad Tobago, so you can work out, you know, from maybe from our sales, official sales uh, reports, or, you know, like the one that they give to Shadow, so you can find out who bought that, and, and dang, so you, you can, you know, you can associate just by knowing the country. You can, you can expand your table, and you can know everything about that customer, right? So it's kind of a very good tool to assess uh, how much anonymity you have in your database. So, so, uh, so how do you use that? Uh, there's two main mechanisms. So, um, you can use suppression, uh, so you can say, well, okay, so if I have a, a low K anonymity uh, score, so that was like serial number was one, company name was one, so you basically just blank it out, okay? <laughs> just, I put just asterisks in there. Oh, uh, country is also bad because we saw that it was a score of one, so it means, <laughs> it means I need to anonymize that, so I put stars in there. Industry was not too bad because it was like 54. Uh, and company size, um, you can basically round it off, uh, you know, if it wasn't a big problem. And detections, uh, it was also very unique, so you can kind of uh, do uh, generalization, so you can break up your numbers into, into chunks. Uh, as you can see, this, you know, you lost most of the information, uh, and uh, you can't really do a lot of machine learning on, on this kind of data set. You lose a lot of precision in the process, right? So, um, but, you know, it's, uh, it, it works on low dimensional data. Um, so, you know, uh, some real examples of uh, how people were thinking about anonymity. Uh, there was the, I don't know if you remember this, 1997, uh, there was this governor, uh, William Well, was re-identificated re by joining the voter registrations in Massachusetts and the anonymized medical data that the government has published, right? And uh, nobody thought about you know, at the time, oh, it was, it's anonymous, but they didn't think about, well, actually, if I join these two, uh, just by looking at postcode, age, and, uh, and gender, I can actually find unique records by joining these two data sets. And they calculated that 87% 87, 87 of the US population uh, have unique date of birth, gender, and postal code, right? So uh, it's quite easy to re-identify people. Uh, one recent one, uh, one was the Netflix uh, challenge, uh, 2006. They release all these ratings, say, okay, it's, it, they're fully anonymized, and we even randomize the rating so that it's more anonymous, right? Uh, but then uh, some, some researcher, I can't remember from where, they say, wow, what if I take IMDb records, right? It's probably this, there are the same movies inside, but there are like usernames and emails, right? And they find out that, yes, just with eight movie ratings and, and, and dates, they will be able to recover 99% of, of the records. So you can actually see who said, uh, a movie was, was crap, right? Uh, and then this was a cool one, uh, New York Taxi Rides, public data set. Uh, it was a um, four-year disclosure, so like uh, by law. Uh, this was, th these were not Uber, this was the taxi cabs by the uni New York uh, uh, City Council. So they had to publish this data, and then <laughs> somebody said, well, what if I look at this data and go into a paparazzi website, I can see if Julia, uh, this was, um, uh, Joalet, uh, Sc um, Sc uh, Scarlett Johnson, I think, yeah. Uh, and they, they basically were correlating pictures from paparazzis, and they find out, well, yeah, she was there at like 3 p.m. on a Sunday, and that was the only taxi that was there in that area. And then they managed to work out how, how many tips, how much tips did they pay to the taxi driver, uh, you know, where she was going. Uh, they found some interesting patterns around nightclubs and uh, strip clubs, so they <laughs> It was uh, not, not very nice, but yeah, so that's the stuff you can do. Mobile phone data is crazy. You can, you can find, uh, you can re-identify 3% of total users just uh, with a day of, uh, um, a day worth of uh, trace, uh, trace data. And, you know, you can re-identify, this is a private research paper, so you can, so obviously mobile phone data is, uh, uh, intuitively, is also not very uh, anonymous. Uh, hacks and leaks always happen, so... Uh, <laughs> Ashley Madison Act in 2015. Uh, I was working in Microsoft at that time, and uh, there was a data scientist, uh, it wasn't me, they published a pie chart of uh, all the major companies like Amazon, uh, Facebook, and Microsoft, just by looking at the domain names of the emails, and they were finding like infidelity, infidelity rates, like who is more infidel, you know, I think, I think uh, was it Amazon I can, or Facebook? I can't remember. But they find out, you know, like it was a nice chart, but then what happened was internally, right, because people had access to the aliens. 
I, I did as well. I was looking if you know if people like I knew they were on Ashley Madison because you can just type your the the email alias in your calendar. And unfortunately, yeah, there were you know managers and other people that were using the website. And I mean, nothing happened from an HR perspective, but it wasn't nice. Yeah, people made jokes like every time we were walking the corridor. Uh, not very nice. And some. One of the wives discovered, and somebody got divorced. So you know, there's some serious uh, side effects when you, you know, something like this happens. Uh, the, to, the 2018 leak uh, it was like location uh, smart. They had a website web, web service that was open, so you can get uh, you can you can put your phone number or a phone of a friend. You can get all these um, location history. That was pretty bad as well. And all these uh, times where companies were publishing stuff and they. They didn't do it properly, so like you can open the PDF and it was just like a, um, a layer of, yeah, it was, you know, human errors, yeah, kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, so what do we want? So, you know, differential price is about asking the right questions, so, um, uh, and there's a few questions that we want to know, um, but without uh, disclosing too much information. And so, for example, uh, I want to see, for example, how many members of the Alliance have seen a particular threat. And for that, you can use differential privacy. Uh, how many customers were infected? You can use differential privacy. Uh, could we combine individual detection fr from every vendor to build a global better one? So you can use um, federated machine learning. Uh, and you know, how good is the detection that I produce uh, in, in uh, you know, with data sets that I have, uh, have never seen? So you can use homomorphic machine learning. Um, so OK. The definition of differential privacy uh, was in, uh, invented by uh, Cynthia Dwork in 2006. Uh, she was working uh, for Microsoft at the time and uh, still now. And uh, okay, it's pretty, I would say it's pretty basic. I mean, I'm not, um, I did a little bit of probability calculus before, but the idea is that uh, you know, if I'm doing a survey and um, um, and I have two choices, one to say yes, I'm a smoker, no, I'm not a smoker. Uh, I need to have a mechanism in place that allows me to, uh, uh, to uh, that that essentially introduce uh, a probability uh, error that doesn't allow me to go back to the original question. Right? The way you do that is basically you introduce noise in your in your survey, so that the same observation could be could be the the outcome of two different uh, two different uh, uh, choices. Right? Uh, and you have you know you can calculate this bound, and you can also calculate the privacy loss. And of course, uh, it's not magic, so you have high privacy, you have low accuracy, you can have high accuracy and low privacy. This is not, that's, the entire concept is you lose something, you gain something, right? Um, mm -hmm. So this is an example, um, so this is an example, a fictitious example, so I want to know if uh, you know how many customers, or like how many members of the alliance have seen uh, the EPT Group 37 uh, this month, and you know people like customers or like members they don't really necessarily want to um, disclose that they're seeing that threat at actors in that specific month. Um, so the way you could do that is basically you have each uh, each members of the alliance responds individually. And we don't have a central database because it's, it's not a good idea. So everybody responds individually, and we shuffle uh, the the responses before they go to the central server, right? And it's a very simple protocol, and you can calculate the formula by hand. It's quite simple. So you flip a coin, right? I flip one coin. If he goes head, I tell the truth. Then I flip it another time. Uh, sorry, if he's tail. Then I flip a second time, and then I say yes uh, if, he's, if it was head, or if I say no if it, if it was tail, right? And, and so basically, you have 50% chance in the first one, and then 25% chance in the second roll, right? Uh, and so the question is okay, so everything I get, it's in this, you can see it's, it's Y, so this is the percentage of people that have said yes, so that's a percentage, so like 75% in the last row or 25% in the first row. And very simple formula, I mean, I did this, I mean, and this correct, you can, you know, it's very simple probability calculus, so you can uh, write the direct uh, equation and then you just invert it, right? And so that means if 75% of our members, of our customers say yes, okay, it means that uh, the the percentage of people that really said yes is one, so everybody said yes, right? So 
this is the expected uh, expected uh, outcome, right? So because pro it's, it's probably it doesn't mean it's hundred percent. It doesn't mean it was actually hundred percent. It means that if you do this experiment, this survey many many times, like infinite at the limit, uh, after many many times, you will converge to that value. But every time you do a survey, it will not be that. Yeah. So you have to understand, right? Okay. And you can calculate these probabilities, and you can say, okay, this is the probabilities of, of observing uh, a yes, so P of O equal to one. Let's say it was like 60% uh, in that case. Uh, and then the conditional probability of having that observation uh, being yes, given the fact that the actual uh, response was one, it was 82%. But the opposite, uh, so the probability of I, that I said yes, but I didn't say yes, is 0.33%. Uh, uh, what that means is that there is a skew. I mean, this is literally hard to understand, but it's basically it's more likely if I see a yes that you actually have said yes for real, uh, rather than you say no. Okay, so it's it's uh, it's asymmetric, but it's still uh, uh, a privacy. You know, you can still do any particular inf inference, right? Because you can still say 100% that I said yes. Uh, I mean, this is a bit. I mean, it takes time to digest that, but yeah. Um, so, 30 minutes. Uh, we have examples from federated learning. So, this is I took uh, DNS logs, um, and uh, the idea is you have three vendors. I put Cisco, Palo Alto, Netto, and Fortinet, and everybody sees a different. Uh, you know, they have different feeds for, for DNS logs, and uh, I, I would I, I kind of imagine that Cisco is seeing Alexa and Cripple, um, is seeing like Alexa domains. You know, top. Under the domains, but he's also seeing CryptoLogger, right? Uh, and he, he can build his own logistic regression classifier on that one. Palo Alto may be seeing Alexa uh, and, and Gods, which is a, is a botnet, and Fortinet in the same period was seeing Alexa and, and new Gods, right? So everybody has their own uh, classifier that is able to tell if a, if a domain was uh, good or bad. Uh, and the idea is that you, com you can combine all these local classifiers. Uh, you can produce um, a big uh, a global classifier, and then you can feed it back, right? And the way it works, it's you train your classifier in plain text, you encrypt the the weights of the logistic regression, and you use basically um, uh, this Pylier uh, crypto that was invented in 1999. You combine these weights uh, with which are encrypted. You decrypt them. You decrypt them. You build a, a clear text gradient, and you send it back to each partner. Right? They sum it up again, and then they <laughs> retrain the classifier so that they have better predictions. Okay? Uh, so trust me, it works. And to show that, I actually implemented it one version, um, and I took uh, f uh, 4,500 uh, DNS record logs. 4,000 were from Alexa, top uh, under domains. Well, the top, yeah, 5,000 domains. I got open DNS, there were 52 crypto locker domains, uh, 167 gods and new gods, roughly on the same, in the same proportion. Uh, I trained test split 80, 20%. It's pretty common in machine learning. And I used logistic regression with uh, gradient descent for like 50 iterations with the learning of, oh, but these are all parameters. And I am using a key size of 124, uh, 1024 bits, which is kind of enough for the kind of precision you need for logistic regression. And you can see that, so before this is, you know, on that slide, before it means every partner build their own classifier to classify those logs, and they, they achieved a certain uh, a precision recall rate. So, you know, C squared 84, 76, 86, 82, et cetera, et cetera. After you combine all these models, uh, the idea is hopefully you get something better, which did happen. So, you know, Cisco now gets 86% for both precision, precision recall. Palo Alto, <laughs> it was very unlucky, he lost a little bit on precision, but gained some little bit more on recall. In Fortinet, uh, you know, we got 1% point more and, uh, you know, 3% uh, more on, uh, on recall. And although they seem like small percentages, when you talk about volumes, it's quite a lot, right? I mean, I mean, even in, in uh, vision machine learning, like if you have an improvement, like you know, it's, it's quite a lot, right? And obviously, homomorphic encryption. So Pylier is a form of semi, um, uh, not fully homomorphic en encryption, and it just takes more time. You know, it's uh, so you know, with with Pylier, it took me nine around nine seconds on this MacBook Pro uh, to train you know, to do the entire um, the training loop. But you know, if I was doing it without, it was 196 times faster, right? So. Uh, 
Then, the cool things, you can also use homomorphic machine learning for email filtering. Uh, this time I took a, um, uh, a public domain from uh, that, I don't know if anybody remember this, but Aaron was, um, there was an investigation many years ago uh, by the US government because they were uh, involved in uh, various, uh, let's say, not very legitimate activities, unfortunately. Uh, so what they did after the investigation, they published everything, right? And the funny thing is, like, all the emails that they published from, from the internal corporate network, uh, they forgot to anonymize them. So, um, so uh, when I, at the time when I was looking to that, I found all the credit card numbers, social security numbers, uh, you know, people going to the doctor, people with cancer, that kind of stuff. And, and then, uh, you know, and then after a month later, oh, somebody said, well, actually, there are credit card numbers. Oh, shit, okay. It's, and they, they, they took it back, so you can find the original data set. Anymore. I have one, uh, but you can, if you go now, it's not anymore. There was a company who wrote reg regular expressions to remove all the credit card information, that kind of stuff. But you can download now the, anon well, the one without private information. Um, so the cool thing you, you can do with homomorphic uh, machine learning is, uh, um, so, you have, so Cisco, uh, one of our partners say, oh, I, have a, I want to build a, a logistical regression model for classifying ham or spam, okay, or phishing, whatever. But I don't want to, you know, I don't want to give that to, um, you know, I want to try if this, um, this model performs really well on data that I've never seen before, uh, but, you know, I don't want to ask Fortinet to send all the email, like, because it's pre pretty sensitive. So how do I do that? So you take all your uh, uh, data set, uh, which is private, you build your classifier, you encrypt it with your private key, which is the red key, then you send the encrypted model to, to Fortinet. Fortinet then uh, apply the, the, the get, get your public key and uh, take all these emails and produce predictions with that one, okay, with the encrypted model uh, and, and your pu public key. So what you get out of that, you have an encrypted score. So Fortinet can see if a particular a uh, email was ham or spam because it's encrypted, okay. Then <laughs> Fortinet, it's a little bit laborious, but it works. You, you send back the, uh, the vector of encrypted scores back to Cisco. Cisco takes, again, his private key decrypt it and is able to see how many emails were classified as spam or ham, right? And then you can tell Fortinet, oh, I'm pretty cool. Do you want to buy this, right? Because, uh, you know, it's quite cool. I get, I don't know, 80%, I don't know, 98% accuracy. Or you can say, oh, well, actually, uh, you know, Fortinet can do the same thing and they can compare and say, oh, it's so mine is better. And I don't know, do you want to share the model or something like that? So, you know, you can do, you know, many things with it. And this was, again, with very basic Palio crypto um, algorithms. And again, real example, so I took uh, 11,000 emails from the Enron data set. Uh, it was a little bit unbalanced, so like 27% uh, uh, were uh, spam and 70% ham. You do blah, 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 train test split. Uh, I had 7,997 words from, from the text. And obviously, classify is fast, prediction is fast, it's basically less than a second. Uh, you calculate your, when you encrypt your weights, it takes time, 115 seconds, because you have a lot of weights there, it's like almost 800 words, 8,000 8, words. Uh, you then um, uh, send it to Fortinet, Fortinet needs to predict that with encryption, so it takes a little bit of time, so 44 seconds, send it back to Cisco. Cisco decrypt is again, takes time, 19 seconds. But most importantly, you can see the error rate is the same because, okay, it's basically the, the key size in, is enough to guarantee the same precision, right? Uh, so yeah, and all of this was with default. Uh, I've used a, a very common library that if you want, you can ask me later doing that. And uh, so who is doing this? There's not actually not many companies doing that, uh, and I made a list. Um, so Google released a paper, a tool in 2014 uh, called Rapport, which is randomized aggregative, <laughs> it's like nicknames, it's not very good for to remember that. But, uh, and then they used the uh, uh, Federated Learning on Gboard uh, in last April 2017. And Rapport is basically used to detect unwanted software in Google Chrome, so apparently I don't know if it's true, but there is a rapport, uh, there's a module inside Chrome that is using differential, encrypt, uh, differential privacy to, uh, to monitor what kind of software people are installing, right? And basically what you have, you have an histogram, 
and uh, you know you can see the actual one, which is the the blue one. So you can see it's kind of an exponential one. But then you have the, the one you get, which is privatized. It's you can see slightly different, but it still follows the same distribution, right? So you can still you know it's it's private, but you can still understand things, right? Uh, and it's very good for Instagram and counting. Um, and so that's one module. And then they they are using federated learning to train a global model from local models. And what they do on the Gboard, which is the, the keyboard on your phone where it suggests your key, um, when you're typing something, uh, they use the same approach. So you have a local model on your mobile phone. It gets sent to the, to the cloud, which is all encrypted. They mix it back, they send it back, and everybody get, you know, it, it basically gets better every time more people you have uh, on the system. Apple, December 2017, this kind of a war now. Everybody, every company is like, oh, yeah, they're doing differential privacy. Uh, they, they have three main algorithms, uh, uh, count means catch, essentially. And they use it for a uh, very frivolous uh, use case, basically discovering popular emojis, right? And uh, you can see they wanted to compare what's popular in English and French. And, uh, I guess it's for marketing. But, uh, it is not, well, there's a few differences there. Uh, but also, they also use it for identify high energy and memory usage in Safari and for discovering uh, new words and that kind of stuff. Uh, Uber, they have, uh, believe me or not, but they're actually working on differential privacy. And they have a very cool tool called uh, uh, Chorus. And all it does um, is to rewrite queries into add some noise and get the results already privatized. So you basically have uh, a proxy that rewrites your SQL queries. Uh, before you send it to your SQL database. Uh, so you can put that in between, and there's a few parameters. You have to, it's in Java scale. It's not very easy to use, I have to warn you, but it works. I tried it, and uh, it's pretty cool. They put a lot of effort behind this. Um, Microsoft, well, I knew this because I was working right before. Uh, there's a tool called Pink, Pink, Pink Q. Uh, it's based on C Sharp, and you can do some count average median uh, for aggregation, supports machine learning. And there's an example there. So it's quite easy if you, if you use link before. It's, it's pretty intuitive. So you just use the same interface with a few uh, uh, modifiers. Open mind, this is cool. There's a, a guy from Google who came up with this idea to combine everything. So it sounds awesome. Like, oh, let's combine fed, you know, federated machine learning with homomorphic encryption blockchains and smart contracts. And they're building this amazing tool set uh, that allows to do build models and keep, get paid for that with privacy and you know anti tampering uh, solution it's it's I, I've tried to use it. it's not um, it's, it's still pretty much a work in progress but he's quite clever so I think there will be something soon uh, working but this is this combines everything together so um, I right now I'm not really interested in this because we're not using blockchains in our platform uh, so it's almost 44 minutes yeah uh, the conclusion is we uh, you know the in terms of our platform, so I'm, I'm basically trying to build an API where everybody in the alliance can use differential privacy, federated machine learning, and morphic uh, machine learning. Uh, and you know, so that if it's an API, you don't really have to implement your own solution because you know, it takes time and you know, it's pretty early stage. So uh, you know, people might use different libraries in the future because everything is quite new. So there's nothing like really production level right now. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so, you know, I, if you want uh, access to our uh, platform, I can you know, just give me an email, I can open your account, and if you want to play with the data we already have in our system, then, uh, yeah, just, just, just send me an email, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Wow. <laughs> Oh no, these are oh, no. Is the crypt always no ah okay. <laughs> that was an amazing talk. Uh, so I'm not a machine learning expert. Actually I'm I barely even understand it sometimes. Okay. What, I, what I'm trying to understand is is do do some of these uh, these anonymization methods, privacy protection methods work for all machine learning methods? Because I understand there's a lot of different ways yep. you can build models. So how how flexible is this? Yeah. So he's basically asking can I apply homomorphic encryption to every algorithm. Um, you can, yes. Uh, there is no reason why you couldn't because, okay, so it depends 
on the so the Pilear scheme only supports multiplication, addition, uh, and sum. <laughs> okay, and pr product sum, product and sum, right? So if you're doing something like um, a neural network that requires a logistic function, it's tough. You have to approximate that into um, a Taylor expansion. So you can't do everything right now, but the way I'm using it is that I'm just encrypting the weights of the, of the model. So I'm not really training the actual model with a morph. You can do that. I mean, you can do that, but it just takes a lot of time. So this is just encrypting the weights, and then they are encrypted. I send it back, and the guy is basically decrypting the model and using that. So there's, the people have done it with neural networks, like the f almost the, you know, the actual full implementation in, uh, by just takes just takes too much time because you, know, you have to approximate all these operations in sum and additions and constants and you have to you know and you know ne neural networks are big so if you have like a, an image you know if you do deep learning it's, it's not something you can do in a you know with, with you know something like that you put in production for security logs it's just forget it right yeah so yeah any other questions we have some time No. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.